Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Monticello live streams this week. We're starting a little early um, at 1230, but we did that so we could make sure we could get a, spend a good amount of time with our guests today. I'm Gary Sandling. I'm going to host this conversation uh, for our, our weekly live stream. And today we're going to talk about um, political turmoil and violence in uh, early America a topic that uh, we we looked this week, we had really planned to do a little more straightforward uh, discussion of Jefferson's first inauguration. And then like everyone else, we saw what happened on January 6th. There have been lots of historical uh, examples in the debate around uh, the election and in that moment um, that have been brought forward. Um, so we thought we'd switch gears a little bit. We will talk about Jefferson's uh, first inaugural address as well in that peaceful transfer of power. But I think it's safe to say that um, last time the Capitol was overrun uh, by a group of people bent on, uh, at the very least, um, causing intimidation and possibly as investigations reveal a lot more was 1814 and it was the British army under Major General Ross, not uh, U.S. citizens. So the events of January 6th in some way don't have a parallel, uh, but they've got lots of precedents. So um, we'd like to talk about some of those today with Dr. Lindsay Shavinsky. So Dr. Shavinsky is a presidential historian and currently serving as a scholar in residence for the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College and she's a senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies here at Monticello. Previously, she was a historian at the White House Historical Association and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. And she recently uh, is published last year in April. She's the author of the award-winning The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, which was published by Harvard. And her writing has been featured uh, in a variety of media outlets, Washington Post, USA Today, The Hill. Check out her website. You'll see lots and lots of media links. She's been pretty busy, I think, lately. So welcome, Dr. Shervinsky. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. We are, and we are as well. And you know, we'll probably jump around a bit chronologically, but we're probably gonna focus a lot on the years from the, the War of Independence, you know, from 1775 when that war started down to the Civil War. But let's let's begin by noting that in what we've seen in the in the news with protesters um, who first showed up for a rally and then some of whom uh, engaged in this this insurrection or storming, lots of people are using different language for, for what happened. Um, but but this occupation of the Capitol you see, I saw tricorn hats. I saw people wearing sort of not great renditions of 18th century, uh, of regimental, uh, you know, of regimentals, of army uniforms of the day. I saw the Gadsden flag, right? We saw these, these images of, as well as the Confederate flag. So we're seeing it, historical images being deployed or iconography being deployed. Um, so there was a lot of arguing uh, amongst the people who had in fact fought and engineered the revolution about what that revolution meant, right? What the spirit, as Jefferson called it, of 1776. Um, and sometimes those arguments morphed into protest and then even crossed into these, uh, the territory of violence or insurrection. So are there some moments you would highlight in, in kind of the early history of the U.S. that, that um, have some, pre that are precedents maybe of what we're seeing? Yeah, I think that's a great place to begin. The concept of sort of what the spirit of 1776 is, is really that when faced with a, uh, a monarch or a government or leadership that is so um, abusive and so intense that one is obligated to pick up arms and defend oneself against those sort of abuses. And we see that starting with things like the Boston Tea Party and the revolution itself. And so the concept of defending oneself through violence, if necessary, is deeply baked into the American identity. And that makes sense sometimes. And, you know, virtuous self-defense is a thing. The problem is one man's abusive monarch is another man's, you know, very, very good monarch and, and you know, very benevolent king. And so... The problem with sort of the American identity and, and that 
basis of violence is that people usually don't agree. And so when we look at the American Revolution, we think of the Minutemen and George Washington's army were obscuring the part where loyalists were often abused, their land was seized. Um, best case scenario, maybe they were, you know, tarred and feathered, which was a very, very violent spectacle, all the way down to sort of the outright civil war in places like South Carolina between loyalists and uh, rebel militias. And so our American identity is one that hasn't fully grappled with the fact that we embrace violence as sort of a central part of our ideology of who we are, and that we see that sort of carried forward in American history through things like, you know, Western expansion and the cowboy identity. That is a very violent lifestyle that is, um, that requires the displacement of Native Americans and um, a very violent and rugged life. And so there have been moments all throughout American history where part of, you know, who it, what it means to be an American and to be this rugged individual inherently sort of obscures the violent tendencies. So thinking about that, you know, after the, uh, after the, the revolution, so it's kind of one thing to agree, you know, all of these different states or colonies that become states and these different factions, certainly, as you point out, a lot of people did not agree, you know, with the outset of the war that there should be independence as the war, this long eight year war, which affected wide swaths of, of the country. Um, and uh, as that war progressed uh, there for a variety of reasons, people joined uh, that that cause of independence, the patriot cause. Um, so the war progresses, independence is won, and then these uh, the people who who had to frame this new government, right? Jefferson in the Declaration talks about what you say that there are situations where, and it can't be as he says for light and transient causes, right? That there has to be a long reflection of of a justification for uh, any kind of of violence against the government. But once that's all achieved, there's there's it's one thing to, to sort of achieve that end, and it's another to figure out how to govern. So differences emerge pretty quickly um, and on a variety of levels. And um, some of the first of these uh, concern sometimes, um, you know, an early example of political violence is in Massachusetts in 1786-87, right? Something that we don't talk about a lot, Shays' Rebellion. Um, and, you know, can you talk a little bit to us, uh, with us about what that, um, you know, what that looked like or what, what were kind of the consequences of, of that activity? Absolutely. I would actually start with one earlier, um, which was the Pennsylvania line mutiny in 1783, yep. when Pennsylvania soldiers were very concerned that they were not going to get the back pay that had been promised to them by Congress. They were owed years of salary for fighting a war and defending this new nation. And they were deeply concerned that the war was going to end and Congress was going to go home and they were not going to be paid. And so they marched on Congress to demand that pay. And Congress was pretty nervous about this. And the Pennsylvania officials kind of refused to do anything because frankly, they agreed with the army. And so it was actually up to Washington to send in additional troops to protect Congress. And that mutiny actually led to the creation of Washington, D.C., because Congress was so convinced that it needed a district that it could control and that it could um, ensure its own self-defense against states and sort of mutinous soldiers, if need be. But that idea, I think, it continued into the Shays Rebellion, like you're talking about, and into some additional rebellions that we can talk about in the 1790s, where a lot of Americans who had fought for the war, Shays was a, um, a Revolutionary War veteran, felt that the ideal that had been promised to him was not uh, being paid, and that he was being treated unfairly by this new government that he had tried so hard to support and had fought and sacrificed in order to get it off the ground. So Shays' Rebellion was really a matter of taxation, like so many of actually the rebellions early on in the early Republic. And uh, Massachusetts passed a fairly strict taxation law to try and pay off some of its war debts. And it required that taxes be paid in specie or hard currency rather than paper money. And that was really burdensome, especially on the Western 
parts of the state where specie wasn't all that frequent and they frequently bartered and they paid off their taxes and their bills with crops and services and other types of goods. And so a lot of Western farmers were unable to pay their taxes and their farms were being foreclosed upon. And so Shays led a series of rebels to protest these taxes and to basically shut down the courts so that they couldn't rule against farmers and that farms couldn't be seized. And um, that was eventually crushed and uh, Shays was arrested along with a number of other rebels. But what's really fascinating about Shays Rebellion and some of these other ones like the Whiskey Rebellion and Freeze Rebellion is that often amnesty was then offered afterwards. A pardon was granted later once the point was made that you can't actually close the courts by violence. And frequently the government would roll back some of those more intense policies that had caused such an uproar. So there was a recognition that maybe there were some unfair aspects going on here and they needed to be a little bit more moderate. And certainly th these, th the meaning of these, of this political violence uh, was contested, you know, by the political elites, you know, kind of the founders and the framers, all of those guys who get a capital F you know, before the names, the kind of the white male elite establishment uh, debated the significance of, you know, for some, these were anarchy. Um, and for others, uh, it was proof of sometimes that for, for someone like Jefferson, um, Shays Rebellion was something he saw, we'll come back to this in, in a bit, a very famous quote of Jefferson's comes in part about Shays Rebellion, but saw it as um, worried about the government becoming so uh, oppressive uh, in these moments. So there's there's a lot of leniency here, as you point out. Um, and of course, this kind of violence, it's worth, I want to bracket this, you know, we're talking about political violence. Um, there are lots of other, you know, there's a lot of violence in early America compared to today. Um, you know, the kind of violence around, uh, as you said, frontier war and conflicts with native peoples and kind of settlers pressing in on and violating treaty rights and, and kind of indigenous responses. There's violence related to slave regime that is incredibly brutal. This violence is, is kind of violence being acted upon um, for these sort of specifically political causes. So as the government forms in Washington, your own work, you know, your own book about the cabinet, we start to see parties form, right? In the, in the conflict over that vision of the country. Um, and we see, um, uh, you know, the framer set up a government that really didn't involve parties, right? I mean, but it's it's always kind of shocking to me that, you know, they they sort of want a government that has no parties and they say parties are bad. Everybody says parties are bad, right? Um, they look to particularly those in the Anglo, you know, in the sort of Anglo-American world, those kind of English speaking elites, they look to Britain and they look to what happened in the 17th century with, you know, a, a decade plus of wars and destruction and upheaval, the regicide of a king, um, all of this, and they say that parties come from that and faction is bad. We want to govern together. But then they get faction pretty pretty quickly. Um, where are times where that heated rhetoric, you know, Hamilton and Jefferson represent and symbolize in a lot of ways, but they're not the only players. It's not a two, it's not a two-person play. It's not even a five-person play, but leave that aside. You know, where are times where that crosses the line from rhetoric to uh, threats of violence or, or actual violence, that early party strife. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I want, I just want to build off your point about the violence in society more broadly, which was that, uh, I mean, Americans are a very violent people at the time um, in a variety of different ways. And personal defense of honor was an important part of that system and the ability to defend and the willingness to defend your honor through violence is a subject that has been brilliantly written about by Joanne Freeman in a number of different books. Highly encourage everyone to look at Affairs of Honor and Field of Blood. Um, those are sort of the, the peak works on personal honor and violence in the time. But the types of rebellions that we're talking about actually were not intended towards individual violence. They would often shut down systems of justice or tax collection, and they would try and intimidate individuals into stopping that tax collection, but they weren't actually trying to kill people, and they weren't really trying to even individually harm individuals um, as, if, as long as it could be avoided. Um, and so I think that is an important distinction, especially when we're thinking about contemporary parallels, that this violence was really intended to achieve 
a political outcome about a specific policy rather than to inflict harm on individuals. But um, when we think about the 1790s and the two camps, as you, as you said, are represented by Hamilton and Jefferson, who certainly had plenty of violent words to say about each other, although they never actually came to blows themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of other Democratic Republicans or Jeffersonian Republicans or even just Republicans, however you want to, however you want to call it, and the Federalists, they did come to blows. There were duels of honor over these things. There were conflict and conflicts and scuffles, even on the floor of Congress. So there were a couple of congressmen who, uh, Griswold and Lyon were two who were known for really coming to, to blows. Lyon spat on Griswold and Griswold caned Lyon and they were both censured by the house and threatened to be expelled. And all of this happened on, on the floor of Congress. So we haven't quite gotten there yet, which is always a good sign. Um, but this concept of personal honor and your political identity and your beliefs wrapped up in those things. And if someone insulted you or attacked those things, people were pretty quick to try and defend that. And maybe it was with words and sometimes it was with canes and sometimes it was with guns if need be. And one of our viewers, Scott, was asking about recommendations you know, for books, documentaries, et cetera, on the topic. And of course, as you said, two of Joanne Freeman's works uh, Affairs of Honor and Field of Blood, which even features the death of a congressman at the hands of another in a duel with rifles. I've never understood how anyone dueled with, <laughs> with rifle. This was later. Um, and, and you know, it's it's it seems so strange. To, I mean, so this seems so strange to us. It's almost comical, this idea of people facing off and, and you know, but there was nothing. It was deadly serious and there was nothing, you know, at the time it was this very serious business. Um, how um, do the policies, how does the, what does this tell us about um, the way, uh, you know, what, what do people want, the people who can vote and the people who own property, especially, which is a very small percentage of the population, but for actually for some of them, what do they hope to get out of um, when they engage in this kind of protest? You know, what are they, are they just seeking to are they seeking to really change the structure of the government or are they seeking to make the government work better for them as they see it? Well, most of the time they're not seeking to completely overhaul the structure of the government. They're seeking to when, so for one example, when Shays led his rebellion, when the whiskey rebellion took place, when freeze rebellion took place, they were really seeking to overturn a singular tax policy that they felt was really unfair and unduly burdensome to Western regions in the state. And um, that was largely a by byproduct of the fact that most Eastern regions had a lot more representation in Congress. And so frankly, congressmen didn't really care if the tax policies were unfair to Western regions. And so they were kind of right. Um, and so, but in those instances, they were very much intending just to overturn that one policy. They were not trying to get rid of Congress or get rid of the presidency or anything like that. It was really just trying to seek redress to those one options. And the reason the government cracked down on that is because they said, that is not how you seek redress for policy. You vote for policy, you vote for representatives. And if you want to overturn those policies, the way to do that is through a ballot box, not through violence. The more personal violence that we're talking about, the duels, the system of honor, that is a little bit more about defending your view of government um, more broadly. So when we move past the early Republic period and into the 1840s and into the 1850s, representatives were selected because they were deemed uh, sufficiently willing to fight for their view of government and their system of government. So Southerners voted for congressmen that would fight to defend the institution of slavery and states' rights over that decision about slavery. This is something that Dr. Freeman has talked about a great deal. And Northerners eventually started voting for congressmen who would be willing to fight back to try and push back against slavery and the slave power. And so then that became much more of a vision of what government should be and should do as opposed to just one particular policy. That's a really good point. And it's kind of one that that leads to maybe another question before we, we come back to maybe Jefferson and kind of his views and, and actions, you know, in the midst of the these early early history, you know, there was this polarization that happened, right? And and it happened very starkly over slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, 
you begin to see um, this play out in, in a variety of ways. And there's real political burdenship. You know, there are elites who are using the threat, especially, you know, Southern congressmen, of the, particularly of the Democratic or what, what, you know, we would think of as the Jeffersonian Democratic Party, who threaten disunion, threaten to leave the union if slavery, if any question about slavery is entered into. This question is one that, that just, like it was a rift that grew and it was a divide that then radicalized people. Um, and it's, you know, there's, there is a, I, there's a, I won't call it a game. There is a conversation that you see sometimes media uh, people have that historians certainly, um, you know, even uh, have said is like, is today like the 18, which year in the 1850s is it? Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. It's starting to feel a little bit like 1860, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but uh, Jamel Bowie wrote a piece in the New York Times where he, he quoted Lincoln, right, in a speech he gave, the very famous, well, at least people who track this stuff, the Cooper Union speech is a very, uh, very well-known one of Lincoln's. It's a long speech. Um, he invokes Jefferson in it and the Declaration. Um, but, you know, Bowie quotes him as talking about this polarization where these political elites say, you um, you, um, you won't abide the election of a Republican president in that supposed event. You say you will destroy the union. It, and he compares it to a highwayman who holds a pistol to my ear and then says, stand and deliver or I shall kill you. And then you sh will be a murderer, right? He's sort of saying this brink, this brinksmanship um, threatens to destroy the union, but you blame me for destroying the union. You're kind of in different territory there than earlier, right? I mean, what sort of happens? I mean, what happens in the 1850s? Not I mean, there's a lot there, but sort of polit what's different about what politicians and political elites are doing in the sort of years that we know will lead up to the Civil War? Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point, And that's such a great parallel. Unfortunately, in the 1850s, the Southern Democratic Party starts playing by a different game. And um, essentially, Republicans are bringing a knife to a gunfight. And so they are not they're not playing by the same rules. And Republicans are trying to deal with Southern Democrats in good faith and trying to find an area in which they can have common ground. And we see this in Lincoln's first inauguration. He's basically saying to the Democrats, I'm not going to touch slavery in the South. I will not touch your institutions. I will not touch your way of life. I just won't permit the expansion of it. And this is a compromise offer that he's trying to get people to agree to, to stay in the union, to keep the border states that had not yet seceded in the union. And the Southern Democrats are not playing by those rules. They're saying basically the minute that he is elected, they're out because they don't trust that he won't go after slavery. And to a certain extent, we are dealing with a little bit of the same parallel today. And we see similar conversations where, you know, sometimes the media has been attacked for saying, you know, both sides in the politicization. But Democrats, you know, when Trump won, there wasn't a, an effort in Congress to object to those votes, even though they disagreed and they hated the outcome. They didn't come to Congress and object to the certification of the Electoral College. A lot of Republicans, not all Republicans, but a lot of Republicans in Congress did. And they are playing by a completely different game. And so I think when historians observe these developments, that's what they're seen as this parallel is the two sides are not necessarily operating with the same goal in mind. And that's really what happened in the 1850s is they were they were pursuing different goals. Republicans wanted to keep one union and to prevent the expansion of slavery. And Democrats wanted to pursue the expansion of slavery and were willing to completely destroy the union in order to make that happen. Interesting. Uh, so I have a que there's a question that's come in about social media's role today and, and thinking about is that, um, which I want to come back to. Um, but first I want to then, so, so one of the things that sounds like I'm hearing you say is where the real fault lines and where real trouble can, can come is if you do have sort of two different sets of uh, tact strategies, tactics, and end games in mind that don't align um, and it's one thing to agree, disagree politically, and it's another to then sort of resort to kind of this absolutist, uh, I don't, for lack of a better word, language about it. In Jefferson's first inaugural in 1800, this is widely sort of heralded as the first peaceful transfer of power, right? So things could have gone off the rails uh, in 1800 in a lot of different ways. 
ways. Um, and they didn't. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, that's Hamilton plays more or less of a role in, in, in that. Um, but certainly in the end, Federalist, I think it's safe to say that Federalist in the lame duck Congress that were in the position to be president makers um, and were divided over, um, even though, of course, the federal none of the Federalists got the, the, the most electoral votes, um, they, you know, they had to decide what they were going to do. They end up uh, choosing Jefferson after 36, you know, on the 36th ballot. Um, he gives this first inaugural address. It's widely kind of heralded as uh, a reckon, you know, sort of an attempt to unify, reconcile the country. And he talks about we are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. Not every difference uh, of opinion is a difference of principle. It's really moving and important. Um, and, you know, talk about that, the effect of that. Um, because like one commenter saying, well, you're going to get beyond these divisive conflicts. Well, we think these divisive conflicts are pretty important to our current moment. We are trying to look at where, you know, in a moment where it could have gone off the rails, Jefferson looks at a way to sort of attempt to unify the country. Talk a little bit about that address. Sure. Yeah, I think that this is a really important moment. And just for context, most Americans at the time still had a pretty good memory of being in the British Empire. And they also were students of history and they were very attentive to what was happening in Europe. And so they understood that by and large, when there was a transfer of power in Europe, it usually was accompanied either by death, revolution, guillotine, scandal, civil war. I mean, it was a bloody disastrous affair. And that was something they were very nervous about. And rightly so, because peaceful transfers of power really didn't happen until that point. I mean, that is truly something that the United States sort of created and established as a theme for the world. Now, I would argue that we've ended that transition, and this is no longer a peaceful transfer of power if you have to have a green zone in order to have an inauguration. But we can get to that in a second. Um, the reason I think that uh, the Jefferson moment is so important is because actually all sides were willing to participate in this endeavor. So John Adams gets a lot of flack for not showing up to the inauguration, but I think that's not totally fair to John Adams because there was not yet a tradition established that a losing president would go. It is possible that he thought that his uh, attendance would be divisive, would be distracting, would cause scandal or something like that. And he did, in fact, although he made some, you know, midnight judicial appointments, which we uh, obviously remember, he also sent Jefferson letters that said, you know, here are how many horses and here's the status of the carriages in the stables. Just thought you should know in case you want to purchase something else. That is not someone who's trying to make the next president's life much harder. And I think John Adams also could have played a much more divisive role once the election was thrown to the House of Representatives. He could have absolutely caused problems either in the House or in the press, and he didn't. He said, I lost. It is up to the House. They decide who the next president is going to be. And then Jefferson recognizing that first of all, that Adams had done that and that he had this moment to try and bring the country together gives the famous line, which is that we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. That is an incredibly unifying gesture um, at a time when he was also referring to his election as the you know revolution of 1800. And while there were aspects of his administration that were revolutionary, there was a lot that stayed the same and that he could have burned down a lot of the norms and customs that the Federalists had established, and he didn't. And I think that he recognized that having some continuity, reaching out and offering that olive branch was really, really important and set the stage going forward for what eventually became the era of good feelings and sort of, you know, one party rule. But that really took both sides agreeing to participate in that peaceful way. I think that's that's a great summary of uh, you know, Jefferson's mindfulness. He did. He, of course, did usher in a period where the, the Democratic Republicans were the dominant force, thanks in part to his political canny and to the three-fifths clause as you know, a fact that wasn't lost on a lot of Federalists. But, um, you know, there's, he, you know, he affected symbolically, you know, kind of things that he wanted to communicate in the inauguration about Republican simplicity, um, to be sure. But there is some continuity there that we often uh, don't think about. So I think that's, that's a really helpful contribution uh, 
to our conversation. Um, I think the, let's talk briefly to wrap up. We'll talk about one or two other things. Um, crowds and mobs, right? So mob, a term that, you know, comes really from the late 1600s. Um, so clearly after the Civil War, there are ways in which um, there are a lot of white supremacist groups that use kind of mob violence to enforce racial norms um, in ways that are kind of outside our purview, but there were some of the most graphic illustrations of this in American history happen in that time period. But before the Civil War, are there places where large groups of protesters or movements um, had an effect on the country's politics that are worth thinking about? Um, certainly not in the same scale. I would encourage everyone. Um, I know this is a subject that is not actually usually covered in history books, but and even I learned about it relatively recently, despite being in school for approximately a billion years. But the Wilmington insurrection of 1898 is really worth looking at because it was a successful coup on the state level. And it overturned a biracial and very diverse government that in place of and put in place a white supremacist government. So um, I know that's a little bit outside our scope, but I encourage everyone to Google it because I do think it's something that needs to be more in our national consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, prior to the Civil War, there wasn't the same sort of large scale mob violence to overturn a government in that way. But there were certainly some actors who had some ideas and some designs about creating some new governments, creating some new empires, some new countries. So, of course, Aaron Burr is notorious for his schemes to try and create a new country in the Southwest. But he wasn't the only one. Um, William Blount, who was or Blunt, I never really know how to pronounce his name. Um, he was a congressman, he was a senator, and he was trying to create a separate country as well in the new Louisiana Territory because he had invested a ton of money in that land and he wanted it to be more valuable. Um, and then, the, of course, the three rebellions that we talked about, Shays Rebellion, Whiskey Rebellion, Freeze Rebellion, and those are just in the 1790s. Um, and then there are times when mobs don't really start out as violent mobs and kind of turn into that. So Jackson's inauguration is a great example where uh, Jackson supporters were so excited about his inauguration that they went to the White House to celebrate with him, which was pretty common practice to open the doors to the White House on inauguration day. And so many people came that actually Jackson's sort of close aides were worried about his security and basically had to pull him out the back window because the mob was so intense, crushing him inside the house. And then they were so excited about being in the White House that they decided to take a bunch of souvenirs and basically snipped bits of carpet and uh, furniture and <laughs> curtains and then also trampled a lot of the gardens. So that was certainly more um, damaging than they intended. And they didn't necessarily have malicious intent, but it did kind of become an overwhelming crush of people. So maybe one last question to wrap up, and it's related to one of the viewers, Jan, had asked about, or earlier, sorry, Jim's question about social media, and then related maybe to Jan's question about how people are identified um, who took part in these political, in this political turmoil and violence. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, certainly Jefferson and others in the early, in the founding era, Jefferson's very famous for saying, you know, if I'd rather, you know, he, even though he, he didn't often like newspapers um, and didn't like the press, he, he, he did not have a great relationship uh, with the press. If, if it wasn't the press he'd helped establish or found, um, it's very partisan press in the early Republic, right? I mean, every, there's, there's the notion of kind of any journalist of objectivity is not really part of the, the rationale of these papers. But, um, but there's also this advocation for Jefferson, you know, says, you know, let re where reason is free to combat, you know, a wrong opinion, as long as there's information to help make a decision. Today, we're, we're buried in information, right? We have an information overload coming from every corner. And sometimes you don't even know how to vet, you know, the source of the information. Um, you know, this principle about um, uh, a free press and, and this idea of, of educated citizenry um, was important in the era. Um, and maybe the question is, you know, what, what were kind of, I know that there's many different points of view of this in the founding era. So, you know, but what are kind of some of the views about 
uh, the press and the role of citizens that we see in the early Republic in the midst of all of these events. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to note from the very beginning that the presses at the time were incredibly partisan and just printed lies. I mean, just lies. And I think that the difference and the thing that is really important to recognize today from our partisan standpoint is that everyone at the time understood that the newspapers were partisan. So if you were a Federalist, you read your Federalist newspaper and you didn't necessarily expect that it was going to be treating an object with objectivity or a person with objectivity. And I think where we get in trouble today is that there was this rise of a journalistic ethos in the late 19th, early 20th century, where journalists were supposed to be objective, they were supposed to print the truth. And so a lot of people still think that if it is a news organization, you can trust it just like you can trust Walter Cronkite. And that is very much not the case anymore, because a lot of um, online organizations especially have recognized that the more outrageous the thing you print or you publish, the more likely you are to get clicks. And the more clicks you get, the more money you can charge for advertising. So news has become a for-profit industry in some cases, very similar to how it was in the 1790s. It's just that in the 1790s and early 18, 1800s, 1810s, people still understood that this was the model. Um, but that being said, even though that was the case, most framers or founders or you know, however you want to categorize this group, they recognized that having the freedom of press was essential. So George Washington is a great example. He hated the criticism he got in newspapers. It drove him crazy. He was incredibly thin-skinned. It made him really mad. He hated it especially when they printed lies about where he was going to be because then he felt like citizens would expect him to show up and would be mad at him if he wasn't there, even if he had no intention of ever going in the first place. And the newspaper editors, just to get under his skin, would deliver several copies of their newspaper every day to the president's house, even though he didn't have a subscription, just to kind of poke him and get mad at him. And um, he, he complained about this in cabinet meetings. And yet he understood that the newspapers had the right to print what they wanted. And he really shouldn't respond because the president needs to be above that sort of chaos. And so Jefferson was perhaps the most famous for talking about the need to have an educated citizenry and the need to be able to determine outrageous fact from or excuse me, outrageous lie from fact. But I think a lot of the framers really agreed with that, that citizens needed to be able to understand what they were consuming and take it with a grain of salt as needed. Absolutely. And I think um, it certainly uh, reinforces the idea for us that we have to be critical consumers of what we see and read uh, online to help make those decisions. And uh, I think there's a lot, there's so much more we could talk about, but in, in closing, uh, Dr. Shavinsky, are there any, you know, any other books, texts, uh, do, anything that you would recommend to viewers to say, here's where you could learn more, anything else you might recommend? Um, oh gosh, making a historian choose, choose books is, is like pulling teeth. Um, for those interested in the Shays Rebellion, there is a small volume called Shays Rebellion, which is helpful. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also plug my own book, which is called The Cabinet, and Chapter 7 is on the Whiskey Rebellion, so that if you want to learn more about that and how the government responded to it, that is a good model. Another book that I found to be really helpful for understanding our current moment and putting it in the context of broader American history is How the South Won the Civil War by Heather Cox Richardson. Um, some of you may have read her daily letters from an American and they were profiled in the New York Times lately because she's extraordinary and writes these unbelievable, uh, basically an unbelievable newsletter every night. But that book is really helpful in understanding sort of the parallels to our current moment and how they have been addressed in the past. And I think it also provides a little bit of hope because we have been in incredibly chaotic moments before. And it doesn't mean necessarily that we will get through it, but it does provide a little bit of a template for how that has been done and, and shows that it is possible to overcome these real, real moments of crisis. That is great advice. And if we weren't, um, uh, if, we, if we are devoted to the study of the past and understanding it, if we can't do that, then we should just turn out the lights. Um, thank, you very much. thank you very much for your time with us. Uh, today. And thank you to all of you who have joined us 
uh, and please tune in next week uh, when we will host another live stream. Thanks, Dr. Shavinsky, very much. Thanks so much for having me. Take care.